in our daily life grows, we often fail to see. Warm our hearts with fresh confidence in your word, so that in making room for the stranger beside us, we find your hospitality awaiting us 
and the reassurance of your presence to inspire us to tread the road again and to share the good news of resurrection. Amen. Maybe see it. Is the is mic on? So you saw baby in front of me named Everly, Everly, right? All right. Okay. Um, just so you know, I'm a pastor, Paul, serving Central Korean, not too far away from this church. And I got emergency call from our DS, uh, Simeon Law, <laughs> to baptize a um, baby this morning. And God bless to you, the parents who are baptizing. Um, their daughter, I assume. <laughs> All right, let us start. Um, brothers and sisters in Christ, through the sacrament of baptism, we are initiated into Christ's holy church, and we are incorporated into God's mighty act of salvation. And given you birth through water and the spirit, all this is God's gift offered to us without price. So may I ask the parents and sponsors, stand. So I present Everly for her baptism. So I'm going to ask some questions. On behalf of the whole church, I ask you, do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, reject the evil powers of this world, and repent of your sin? Do you accept the freedom and the power God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves? Do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior, put your whole trust in his grace, and promise to serve him as your Lord in union with the church which Christ has opened to people to, of all ages, nations, and race? Will you nurture this beautiful baby, Everly, in Christ the Holy Church, that by your teaching and example, they may be guided to accept Christ, God's grace for herself, to profess her faith openly, and to lead a Christian life. Now, I'm going to ask the whole church, do you, as Christ's holy body, the church, reaffirm both, of, both your rejection of sin and your commitment to Christ? Amen. Will you be nurture one another in the Christian faith and life and include these a baby person now before you in your care? Amen. Okay, please come forward. Come forward. Father, 
Now, please welcome your new family in Christ. Good morning. The first lesson this morning comes from the book of Acts, chapter 2, verses 14, 14a and 36 through 41. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them, Men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and listen to what I say. Therefore, let the entire house of Israel know with certainty that God has made him both Lord and Messiah, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and to the other apostles, Brothers, what should we do? Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, so that your sins may be forgiven, and that you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you, for your children, and for all who are far away, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to him. And he testified with many other arguments and exhorted them saying, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. So those who welcomed his message were baptized and that day about 3000 persons were added. This is the word of God for the people of God. Please rise for the gospel reading. Now on that same day, two of them were going to the village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all the things that had happened. While they were walking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still looking sad, and then one of them said, whose name was Cleopas, he answered him, are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place in these days? He asked them, what things? They replied, the things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. 
But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem us, Israel, yes. And besides all this, it is now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women of our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning when they said they did not find his body there. And they came back and told us that they indeed saw a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went back to the tomb and found just as the women had said, and they did not see him. He said to them, oh, how foolish you are, and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he inter interpreted them the things about himself in all the scriptures. And as they came near the village to which they were going, he walked ahead of them as if he was going on. But he urged them strongly saying, stay with us because this is almost the evening and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. While he was at the table with them, he took bread, blessed it and broke it and gave it to them. Then their eyes were open and they recognized him and he vanished from their sight. And they said to each other, were not ever our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us. The same hour they got up and returned to Jerusalem and they found the 11 and their companions gathered together. They were saying, the Lord has risen indeed. He has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of bread. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Would you please sing verse one and three in hymn number 613. One, two, and three in hymn 613. of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. As I told you, Jason called at 913 this morning and said he had a problem. And I jokingly said, you want me to preach the sermon? <laughs> I was kidding. He said, well, either that or read mine. So here I am. Do you have a mission statement? If you were held hostage and had to repeat your mission statement in three seconds, could you repeat your mission statement of life? Jesus had a mission statement. It was, I have come that you may have life and that you may have it more abundantly by loving God and loving your first fellow men. 
Can you recite your mission statement in three seconds if you had to? I, I will tell you what my mission statement is, but I also have to go back and tell you how I got there. It's kind of simple. I always tell my children my philosophy is be kind, share, tell the truth. But how did I come to that? I have spoken about my father before. I was really very lucky to be born into a loving family with two good parents who adored each other and took good care of me and my sister. But my father was the primary influence. When he died, he was eulogized in this church as a Christian gentleman, which he was. I learned many things from him. And I remember as a little girl looking up, I must have been younger than 12 because by 12 I was eye to eye with him. And I had heard people talk about high class and low class families. And I said, Daddy, how much money does our family have? Are we high class or low class? <laughs> and he said, Joni, listen to me. Class has nothing to do with money. It has to do with how you treat other people, regardless of their race, their religion, their age, their circumstance. If you treat people with respect, you have class. And if you don't treat, treat them with respect, you don't have class. So I kind of got into this be kind, share, tell the truth philosophy because of my father. He was way ahead of his time. He was a civil rights activist before we knew the term. He was a feminist before we knew the term. He was a very strong man, but he was not above washing dishes and mopping the floor and helping my mother. Um, certainly, uh, the other thing that uh, I would say about, about my father is that he lived, he lived that life of being kind, sharing, and telling the truth. So I, I tried to follow that. The other thing I was going to say is I was also influenced very much by a sermon that Clayton Miller said once. And it was that we should do the loving thing. And the love, you see, we, life is not black and white. If we listen to the news, we think it's very set. But it's not. We have to make decisions. For example, if a woman has an etopic pregnancy, the baby can't survive in the fallopian tubes. If it's not removed, it will burst and she'll bleed to death and the baby will die. So that's a no-brainer. The loving thing is to remove the baby that cannot ever be born. However, if another woman is pregnant and she wants to have a baby, but she doesn't have enough money and she doesn't have any services, the loving thing we can do is to provide for her. The other thing I would say is my father modeled and my mother modeled these things. Way back when I was born, I remember seeing segregationist signs and for whites only, for example, and my father told me that was wrong. Un, uh, unlikely, the organist in our church was from Show Me State, Missouri, and she was a racist. She didn't mind having African-American people sing in the choir, but she didn't think they were equal. My father argued with her, with her, and he invited them to our house for dinner. This was not unusual. And I remember a neighbor we had that was Jewish, and the ladies made fun of her, but my mother invited her for tea. I didn't understand that when I was a child. I knew, I trusted what they were doing was right because I trusted my parents. But it wasn't until after I grew up that I realized how they were modeling these things for me, doing the loving thing, being kind, sharing, telling the truth. This is my life's philosophy. Um, some of you know that I was divorced. This was a tragedy in my life. And I, I kind of fell away from being kind, sharing, and telling the truth because I wallowed in my misery. Enter my father. <laughs> I was crying and sobbing. I wouldn't stop for days. Why didn't he love me? What did I do wrong? Why do you love mommy? Why am I a failure? <laughs> and he said, Joni, stop it. It's not about you. His ability to love and be faithful wasn't there, but you have three children to raise. What are you going to do about it? So I had to focus and get back onto the track. Always my father was a wonderful presence who, who helped me. And not everybody has that, but a profound influence. So I, I want to share that with you, that this is a philosophy. What is your philosophy? What do you live by? And how does it reflect the glory of God? Uh, my oldest grandson last year graduated from college and he called me and he wanted to interview me. 
And I thought that was fun. And I called his father, my oldest son, and said, guess what, uh, Lawrence? Brian wants to interview me. Well, my son likes to make fun of me. So out, out of his mouth instantly, he said, oh yes, he's taken a course in abnormal psychology. <laughs> really? Thank you, son. Well, anyhow, this year, about two weeks ago, my granddaughter, who was a junior, called me and she wanted to interview me about memoirs. Now think about this. When we say about be kind, share, tell the truth, it's a lot harder for kids today. So as I was reflecting on my childhood and how different it is from her, I was born two months after Pearl Harbor. I remember before, I, I remember being three years old because I remember b before my sister was born and I was three when she was born. I was aware of the thing called rations that you could only have so much sugar and so much, you know, flour and, and there was a limit to what people could buy. And I knew that we had a refrigerator because my father had a ration because I was a baby and had formula. Of course, we had no TV in those days or any electronics. The only electronic was a phone, a party line where you could pick up the phone and there'd be four or five families that were also connected to it that you didn't know. And if you needed to make an emergency call, you had to ask them, could you please hang up so I could do this? I uh, also remember the only entertainment uh, basically was movies. My father had one night out and my mother had a night out. My father went to the church choir on his night out. My mother went to the movies with my aunt and the enticement was that you could build a set of dishes. They might say this Monday night, we're giving a platter. Next week, it's a coffee cup. The next week, it's a salad dish. And if you went every week, you had a service, a whole a set of dishes. Um, we had in my school air raids, but we would hide under the desk. We weren't worried about shooters. We were worried about being bombed by the Russians. We also had inkwells and quills and garters. I always tell my students I was before ballpoint pens and pantyhose way back then. We went on one field trip. Last month, my granddaughter went on a field trip to Quebec. Our field trip was to go to somebody's house. One girl had a TV and we watched the inauguration of Eisenhower. And then we went back to school. Now um, we have all these things that are going on. We have all this technology, all this stuff. It's much harder to be kinder, share and tell the truth. It's a real challenge for our children today. So it's important for us to know our mission statement, how we want to serve God by re realizing Jesus came that we might have life and have it more abundantly by loving God and serving our fellow men and living a life that is honest and fair and generous and truthful. So on very short notice, that is my message to you. <laughs> Thank you very much for listening and have a lovely afternoon. Mary, I might need help getting down from here. Oh, wait a minute. Eric, Eric, could I trouble you? Oh, never mind. Almighty God, in your love, you welcome us as your children. Through your care, you have shaped the universe. With your mercy, you hear our prayers. We have prayed for Iris and Barbara and Pastor Jason. Hear us, your children, as we open our hearts to you. Spirit living one, in the beginning you breathe life. In chaos and darkness, you brought hope in many tongues. You spread good news.
Holy triune God, we've heard you calling, so we come. We come with doubt and with fear. We come with lots of questions and imperfect answers. We come having traveled many lonely roads to get here. Yet like those on the road to Emmaus, we trust that you walk beside us and will stay with us. So, oh. And now I believe we will serve God with our offering. Is that correct? Yes. Good. <laughs> While the choir is coming up, I just wanted to say the story of Jesus on the road to Emmaus was the uh, gospel lesson for today, and that was to be uh, the original sermon. So, so I chose this anthem to really reinforce that message, and I want everyone to, as you're listening to the choir, to think about the, uh, the message of this anthem, which is not only telling the story of Jesus on the road to Emmaus, but then where does it, how does that relate to us? And in the anthem we say, when we are walking, doubtful and dreading, blinded by sadness, Christ walks with us, ever awaiting our invitation. Stay, do not part. And so I really want that to be the message for the anthem this morning.
join me in the prayer of thanksgiving. Like the disciples at Emmaus, we offer what we have. They offer their company, their table, their bread. We invite you to be with us, Jesus, as we offer you our love, our devotion, and these gifts. May your eyes be open with your holy presence among us, now and always. Amen. And now let us continue to pray with the confidence of God's children. Father, We will close our service with hymn number 2114, verse 1, 2, and 4. the love of God be with you everywhere you may go.